simple example. We have a tree. There's very beautiful trees here, by the way, in California. Like a cherry tree. I saw a cherry tree. Very beautiful. That tree requires the sun to photosynthesize in order to exist. I think it's fair to say if the tree didn't exist, or if the sun didn't exist, the tree would not exist. It's fair to say this, yes? So long as the, the sun is required, or so long as the tree exists, the sun will exist. Even if that was for an infinite amount of time. Now the sun itself is part of its own order. And it's part of its own set. Now it requires other things in order to exist. At the end of this, what is required once again is an independent thing. That, this independent thing can only be one. Wait a minute. Why is that? Because if there was more than one necessary existence, it wouldn't be a necessary existence. Because it could be conceived that it can be arranged in another way. And you can't have two things which are independent. Because which one is dependent on which? Therefore, whether you conceptualize this ontologically, cosmologically, on materialism, dualism, idealism, you must conclude that what is required in order for any existence to exist is an independent thing. That is one. That is always in existence. Why? Because if it wasn't in existence, if it could be conceived that this thing is not in existence, it wouldn't be necessary. So it has to be eternal. And it cannot be made up of, of parts. Why? Because anything which is a compound is generated. Anything that's made up of parts is dependent on those parts. That's point number one. And point number two, if it was a possible existence, if it's made up of parts, you can imagine those parts being arranged in a different way. Therefore, it falls into the category of possible existence. To summarize, you require an independent thing outside of the series of dependent things in order for any existence to exist. This thing must be one. It cannot have parts. It must be immaterial, incorporeal. Where else must it be? It must be eternal. Now, this is what the Quran says in its basic definition of God. Say he is God, one and only. Allahu Samad. The one who is independent, self-sufficient. Everything depends upon him, and he depends upon nothing. He begets not, nor is he begotten. He is the eternal one, pre-eternal, post-eternal. And there is nothing like him. He's immaterial. He's not composed of parts. He's incorporeal. So you see, this is the argument. If this argument is cracked, I have lost the debate. This is my main argument. Everything goes back to this argument, which goes back to the basic definition of God. What must be presented is a formulation, whether it's a cosmological one or an ontological one, which shows us how it's possible that only possible existences can exist without the independent. If that's done, I'm ready to be an atheist today. Now, the Quran says in chapter 52, verse 35, Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in. Am Were they created from nothing? Or were they themselves the creators of themselves? Did they create the heavens and the earth? Certainly they have no certainty. Saying that the atheistic position is one of mere speculation. You can never achieve certainty with atheism. Why? Because in this logical disjunction, you have four options. Either the universe came from nothing, which is impossible, ontologically, math mathematically, and cosmologically. It's not possible. No one has argued this, really. It's a weak argument. I don't think my interlocutor, with his experience, will go there. He's very prominent and very experienced. He won't go there. And, or, is it eternal? Can it be eternal? Well. Let's say it is. Wait a minute, what did you say? Did you concede to that? Yes, well, no, no problem. Even if it was eternal for the sake of argument, is it dependent or independent? You still have the problem here. But, my interlocutor is a naturalist, so he believes in the beginning of the universe. 
So that's not a problem for us. What other option do we have? Is it self-created? Like my friend Hamza Zulsus says, is it possible for something to exist and not exist at the same time? He gives the example of a mother giving birth to herself. Is that possible? No, it's not possible. Come on. It's not possible. So the other thing is, it was put into existence by something which had the ability to do so. Now, the question is, what are the attributes of that thing which had the ability to put the universe into existence? How do we reason this? By inference, we say, well, if it had the ability to put the universe into existence, it must have power. Because that is required for that kind of thing. It must have creative capacity. It must have knowledge. It must have knowledge. So you see, we start to, to have a formulation. A question now we have to ask is why is the universe one way and not another way? It's conceivable, for example, you see you have celestial spheres in the universe. They're rotating in one direction. We can conceive and imagine of the possibility of all of the celestial spheres in the universe going the other way, for example. We can imagine that. So why is the universe one way rather than another way? I will tell you that the only rational explanation for that is that there is an external particularizer of the universe. Say that one more time. That there must be an external particularizer of the universe to choose between different options, possible options. Because then you have no explanation for why the universe is one way rather than another way. You have to have an external sorting agent. You have to have an external what? Sorting agent that decides X rather than Y. Otherwise, the question will be, to the atheist, how can you prove on naturalism? Or how can you explain on naturalism? That the universe is one way rather than another way? It's a very straightforward question. Now, here's the thing. If we know that there is an external sorting agent, this implies will of this agent. And if there was more than one will, there would be a chaotic universe. As the Quran says, by the Audubon and Shaitan Rajim, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهُ لَفَسَدَتَا فَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَرْشِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ if there was more than one of them, the universe would have been corrupted. The heavens and the earth would have been corrupted. Chapter 21, verse 22. How? Because if there's more than one will, ultimately, which one is steering the ship? There would be chaotic order. The Quran also says, La ala ba'duhum ala ba'd. In chapter 23, verse 91. If there was one, more than one almighty, they would have outstripped one another attempted to outstrip one another for power. So in other words, you can't have more than one of those things for those reasons as well. And this brings me to my third point, which is the argument of the physical coherence of the universe, which is a Quranic argument. Because today I'm just going to be sticking with the Quran. The Quran says, الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فرجع البصر هل ترى منه فطور ثم رجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر قاسها وهو حسير That chapter 67 verse 3 Look at the universe Look up in the sky Look at the sky. Look at the coherence of the universe. Do you see any inconsistencies? Look again. The Quran says, wait a minute. Look again. Let me look. Let me see. Is there any inconsistencies? Now, I thought about this verse. And this verse is telling us that there is a uniformity of nature, a consistency of nature, a coherence of nature. The fact that the universe is uniform and coherent is not known by science. It's presupposed by science. Wait a minute, what did you say? Let me say it one more time. 
If you look, for example, at any introductory guide to the scientific method, like Hugh Gao, he wrote the illustrated uh, guide to the scientific method, he said that the fact that you have rationalizable actors that can see the universe and see its consistency means that there's a presupposition of science. And what is that presupposition? That science is uniform. That the universe is uniform. It's rationalizable. Albert Einstein said in his letters to Solvin, he said the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. So I'm not making a fine-tuning argument today because we've heard enough of that. Every atheist and every non-atheist has heard this fine-tuning argument. What's this fine-tuning argument? The argument is, look at the constants of nature, yes? You have these constants which are in a Goldilocks zone of life-permitting per range. If they were anyway this way or that way, they would not, the universe would not exist and life would not uh, be in, uh, possible in the universe. Like Martin Rees wrote just six numbers and he says N, which is capital N, a number, talking about you know, the natural forces, he says it's a billion, 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 billion. And had any zeros been taken away, yes, then that would have been, the universe would have been completely different. E is another letter that he talks about, the conversion of hydrogen into helium. He says that this conversion is 0.007. Had it been 0.006 or 0.008, we would not exist. This is exactly what he writes. It's not what I'm writing. I'm not a cosmologist. Right? That's what he writes. That's an argument from probability. That's an interesting argument. I think the interesting thing is that many people, theists and non-atheists, accept the fine-tuning of the universe. Stephen Hawkins accepted it. Richard Dawkins accepted it. So it's not really an area of controversy. My argument is about the uniformity of nature, the coherence of nature, which is presupposed by the universe, by the by some scientific method. The question is therefore on naturalism. On naturalism, how can you account for the coherence of the universe? You can't say, well, the universe just is, like Bertrand Russell said, because that is a circular argument, frankly. It's a cop out. I'm asking for an external explanation. We're rational people, we should be able to explain. If, natu if naturalism has the ability to to give us these answers, then surely we should be entitled to such answers. Now, I've got five minutes left, and I've made my arguments. To reiterate, my main argument today is the argument from contingency. And it's not one that Leibniz formulated, it's a different kind of argument from contingency that many Western people are not familiar with. It's from our tradition. And frankly, the main question is this. The question is, how can you explain a world, either ontologically or cosmologically, naturally, that only has possible existences? That's the question. If you can prove it, you've cracked the argument. Now, I know I've, I've been watching his videos. He's an incredible speaker. And because he's a lawyer, he's got that charisma that if, when he starts speaking, I might have to run away, actually. Incredible speaker. But I've, I know, I have a feeling of what he's going to talk about, and I think it's going to be the problem of evil. Right? Now, Epicurus, an old Hellenistic philosopher, he, he had the logical form of the problem of evil. And the logical form went as follows, that if God is omnipotent and all good, then if he's omnipotent, why does he not stop the evil? If he's all good, then how comes evil exists? The answer to that question is as follows. I'm going to give it to you right now. God is not just those two things. He's also all, all wise. So in order for the problem of evil, from an Islamic traditional perspective, to be unlocked or to make sense from a logical perspective, you have to show logically or naturalistically or cosmologically or mathematically or inductively or abductively, any way possible. How? How? Evil, the existence of evil, contradicts the divine wisdom. That's how it goes. We don't believe in a God with three attributes, goodness, or two attributes, and, uh, and omnipotence only. That's not the God we believe in. So we have to show, otherwise it's an emotional argument. Now, the other thing he talks about is the divine hidedness. Why is God hidden from us? 
Now we believe in the fitrah as Muslims. The immediate knowledge of God. The intuitive knowledge of God. And by the way, this is a Muslim specific belief. We believe that we are born believing in God. We have the immediate knowledge of God. And that society strays us away from that knowledge of God. So the Quran, for instance, or the prophets come to reinforce what we already knew primordially, if you like. Primordially, from a psycho-spiritual perspective. So God is not hiding. In fact, he's reminding us. And the Quran says, وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا If an atheist dies as an atheist, and according to us, if he dies as an atheist, he's not heard the message of Islam, he does not go to hell straight away. We can't say this. It's not our belief. So God is not hiding according to us. So these are the two things I'm anticipating he's going to be raising up. So I'm preempting it. And finally, what I want to say, and we'll talk about this, by the way, the fitrah. The immediate knowledge of God because there is empirical evidence of that by the way Justin Barrett made an interesting has many interesting books on this he says that there, there is a, a there is a divine receptivity to God and he done you know studies with children cross-culturally and found that children naturally believe in God so atheism on this idea is a social construct atheism is a cultural construct so finally I want to say that the Quran promises us in chapter number 41 that Allah will show us all the way. In other words, his signs. He says, by the Adabullah Mishnah Tarjim, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim. Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim. Hatta yatabayana lahum. Hatta yatabayana lahum annahu alhaqq that we will certainly show them our signs in the horizons and in themselves until it's made patently clear that this is the truth. I hope today we can be as sincere as possible and be open to this. And I hope now that we go back to that question of how there can be only possible existences. I leave it to uh, Edward for the response. Thank you very much.